here in the chat. Hi, so welcome. My name is Emily Keating. I'm the Director of Education at the Jacob Burns Film Center, and it's a real honor and joy and pleasure to welcome all of you to our first webinar through the National Writing Project um, Educator Innovator Initiative. So I'm here in the Jacob Burns Film Center's Media Arts Lab, which you'll be hearing a little bit more about tonight. Um, our time together is going to give you some understanding of the Jacob Burns Film Center's really unique and groundbreaking work in helping students become more visual learners and visual literate uh, beings and creators. So I'm gonna quickly introduce my guests and then um, we'll begin our begin our time. So I'm going to uh, look here to my right. Hi, uh, my name is Brady Shoemaker and I'm the Director of Curriculum at the Jacob Burns Film Center. My name is Aaron Mace and I'm one of the senior faculty members here at the Jacob Burns. My name is Jen Mundo and I work at John F. Kennedy Magnet School in Port Chester, New York. And my name is Kate Fox. I'm the Director and Founder of the Birch School in Rock Tavern, an alternative mixed stage learning community. And good evening. My name is Alicia Robinson, and I am a music teacher at Roosevelt School in Bridgeport, Connecticut. All right. So um, thanks to all of you for being here. Um, it's been fun to plan this with you, and I'm excited to get into it. So um, as I said, we're many of us are here at the Jacob Burns Film Center. And what I thought I'd do um, is that we would share a quick two-minute video with you that was created in honor of the Jacob Burns Film Center's 15th anniversary. Um, we turned 15 this past June, and we thought this short piece would give you a little sense of our space and our mission. So we began to do this, and we had, had no idea at first whether there would be an audience, what the audience would be like, and who would come here as guests to speak to us. But then a different component started to arise, and that was the education part of this. Filmmaking is the most collaborative part. We're building 25,000 square foot education facility, facility that's open to explore the art of filmmaking and visual communication. People come and they're enormously appreciative of being able to look around and know that they're going to have the opportunity to talk to each other in that same setting. I have not heard of anything like this in Jacob Burns Films that are happening anywhere else in the world. So this it, it is a very unique. Just to quickly tell you a little bit more about the Jacob Burns Film Center. It's like a force for social change disguised as a movie. And as a media organization, we're in a unique position to help share stories. And we think about those stories and the change that we can make together. And that's the goal of bringing you all together tonight. And I'm just so thrilled that you're here. So what I love about that piece is I think you get to see the literal juxtaposition of Steven Spielberg, or Steven Spielberg and fourth grade um, students who are all sharing this space and this mission and this understanding that we are living in a visual culture. Um, we are surrounded by screens, we are connected through story, and we want to raise the next generation of visual storytellers. We want to broaden the voices that are um, heard and the stories that are told. And we've been doing this for 15 years. We've worked with hundreds of thousands of students. Um, we've worked with them from grades pre-K through adulthood on this campus, in schools and after school programs and community organizations. We run after school programs and summer camps. And um, the sort of culmination and the exciting pinnacle of a lot of this work we've done over 15 years has now taken the shape 
of a curriculum called Image, Sound, and Story. And the goal is to take the spirit of all those programs and all those ideas and put them into um, a structure and a curriculum and a professional development experience that can the teachers can access and bring to life in their classroom. And that every classroom can have the same spirit of creativity and innovation that we've tried to create here at the Jacob Burns Film Center. So. Um, our time together is going to um, first share some resources that are on our website that teachers um, and, and anyone really can start using um, immediately. They're free and accessible on our website. And then we'll talk to these teachers. Um, those who you've met have all been part of our image, sound, and story curriculum and um, learn a little bit more how this work can deepen and grow. So I'm going to um, introduce again my colleague Aaron Mace, and he's going to talk us through um, uh, one of our one of the features on the website. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about something we call View Now Do Nows. Um, they're similar to something called Do Nows, which you may be familiar with if you're a classroom teacher. Um, they're really designed to be short um, warm up activities um, to get your juices flowing. Uh, to start thinking about different ideas or concepts. Um, so I'm actually going to show you a few and we're going to walk you through them on our website. So um, we'll switch over. So here's our homepage, um, which you can find at education.burnsfilmcenter.org. Um, so on any of the homepages, if you go up towards the top in the middle, um, you can click on some words that say view now, do now. And that will take you to um, our featured view now do now. So every single week we have a different featured view now do now. Um, we're making them constantly, so there's a new one every single week. And this is the one we have right now. Um, but we're going to take a close look at a couple different ones. Um, so if you scroll down on the page a little bit, you can see um, some recent view now do nows. And then along the bottom there, there are ten different literacy concepts, um, which we're going to dive into a little bit deeper. So we have image, sound, story, character, setting, structure, mood point of view, theme, and style. Um, to get us started, we're going to jump looking into image. So if you click on image, that'll bring you to some image view now do nows. And then if you click on all image view now do nows, you can see all of the ones under that category. Um, and we're going to take a closer look at number 47. Um, so if we scroll down a little bit, um, that one in the bottom left, um, so this is a, a view now do now, and it says extreme close up show us a world full of details we might not be used to seeing. Take your camera and cre create an extreme close up of something with a surprising detail. Um, so anybody could do this. Um, it's free and open to the public. Um, but actually, some students in Alicia's class did this. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to her um, to talk a little bit about what happened in the classroom when she did this. Absolutely. So the space that we work in is a very unique space in that it's the cafeteria because there's no other classrooms when I have this group. So the students, when given this view now, do now, we're able to explore the stage. We actually have an annual musical, so we have different props already on the stage and just different things in and around the cafeteria. And some of the things that they came up with, I was genuinely impressed with. So this is a group of middle school students, seventh grade students, and uh, one of the images in particular, the students took an extreme close up of a book bag. And the book bag, which is not the image that's being shown currently, uh, however, I will talk about that one in just a second. So the book bag has several pictures uh, and patterns of a Pikachu from Pokemon on the book bag. And the student uh, actually staged the picture and put the two zippers uh, over the eyes of the Pikachu, making it look like the Pikachu was looking out into a pair of bananas which is, I mean, definitely something that it takes a unique eye to and uh, to do and something that as a result of having implemented some of the image curriculum, the student was able to really be strategic and intentional about taking the shot. So the shot that you see on the screen now is a soda can. And uh, again, going through the image curriculum, we talk a lot about uh, different shots that you can take. And with the extreme close-up, the students were experimenting with the rule of thirds, but also with uh, the physical, how close they are to the image that they're taking. So this particular student got a great angle by getting down physically on the ground outside and taking this image. <laughs> um, so what I'd also love to point out too is anyone is able to actually upload responses straight to our website. 
Um, so if you were to sign in at the top and create an account, if you don't have one, um, you can then see on the right, it says respond now. So you could actually upload your own responses. So if we scroll down a little bit more, you can actually see there's four right there, but um, you're able to see responses other people have uploaded, which is really exciting, especially in a classroom application where you can see what other people from all over the world, um, how they interpreted that same prompt. Um, so next, what we're gonna do is take a look at a story view now, do now. So again, if we scroll down to the bottom, you can see all the concepts there. We're gonna look at story um, and go again to all, view, all story view now, do nows. And we're gonna look specifically at number 137. So this one um, has a video clip. So after watching this clip, um, it asks you to decide if this is the beginning, the middle, or the end of the story and why you think that. So we're gonna watch the clip and then I'm gonna turn it over to Kate, who's here with us at Jacob Burns, um, to talk about how that went with her students. So um, we did number 137 as part of the story uh, view now, do nows. Um, and one thing about this program is that the videos are very engaging. So our students were very attracted to the video and wanted to watch it several times before they made their decision. Um, very interesting that many of our students had different ideas about that strip of video. So some of them felt that it was the end because the music was fading out and the character walks off at the end. And others felt that um, it was the middle because to some of the students, it seemed as though the characters were acquainted with each other. And yet other students um, also felt like they had they didn't know each other. So there was a, a wide variety of interpretations. Um, but I did notice that since we've been using the image sound and story curriculum, some of the things that they noticed, they were looking at the colors that were being used and they were looking at the, the darkness and lightness and using those clues to help them decide if they thought it was the beginning, the middle or the end. The other thing I noticed is that it enabled them to make connections to previous things that they um, in their life mm -hmm. um, and in the curriculum that we have done so far, making a lot of connections between just that 15 seconds of video um, and relating it to their own lives. And so uh, I really appreciate how engaging the quick little pieces are for them. They just really dive right in. And I think that now that we've been doing it for a little while, they're really open to the idea when, when I present it to them. So it was, it was a really successful one. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. So um, I'd also love to point out too, like all those um, examples and reasoning they were giving for why that's the beginning or the middle and the end. Um, we are creatures who watch a lot of media and so like we innately understand story structure and so they might not be able to like label all the parts of the three-act structure but they know why it's the beginning the middle or the end because they they understand that um so i'm going to turn this over to brady who is going to talk about another free tool um, that we've created yeah i'm going to talk about um uh, actually something that's really great, um, it's called the Visual Glossary. And the Visual Glossary is a tool that we developed um, really because we found that there was nothing out there quite uh, that did what we wanted it to do, which you look up Visual Glossaries, you'll see either text of a film term um, or you might see an image of a film term. Um, but we're really interested in seeing uh, how that film term is used in the context of the actual film. So I'm gonna um, right now share the screen and um, show you uh, our take on a visual glossary. And I'm gonna do that right now. Here we go, uh, sharing the screen um, so that we can take a look at this. And again, this is right on our um, website. So if you take a look, um, again, uh, we were just at view now, do nows up on the top we can click on uh, the visual glossary. It's right there at the top. It's open to the um, public. You can, anybody can access it. Um, and uh, what it allows us to uh, do is actually watch a clip and we can play with the play button. And as this uh, red dot goes through the clip, it'll hit the um, bigger dots and that's gonna be where film terms show up. So I'm just gonna show you an example. Um, here we go, this is uh, from Beasts of the Southern Wild. So you can see right now, this is a wide shot and we can actually see how a wide shot works in an actual uh, clip. Um, 
we go to an establishing shot and we can see what that is. When we go to uh, diegetic sound, um, that's the sound that's actually in the film. Um, we can see the active rack focusing, which is something that you really need to, to see. And we can see a, a point of view shot. The other thing that we can do is we can look down here to see related clips. So if this was handheld, I can click on blind. Uh, oh, here we go. We'll uh, click on um, the voiceover here. We can look down here at related clips. And we could click on a uh, Freedom Riders. Or maybe this isn't necessarily. It's a little slow right now. It's not working. But um, in theory, what you could do is you could click on the related clip. And it will take you to another clip that actually shows, here we go, uh, we can go to the aerial <laughs> shot now. It'll take you right to where that um, shot was in another film. So it's really great to say, oh, this is what an aerial shot looks like in this film. Maybe I want to see it in other films and how they use aerial shots. And I can click to related, uh, the related clips through there. It'll take me right to it. Another great feature um, is that I can search uh, through um, my terms. So it's alphabetically listed of film terms, and then I can see my examples. Um, but another great feature is I can actually search with clips. So if I have a clip that I'm interested in or I'm doing something in my class, and I know that um, one of these clips uh, relates to a subject uh, that I'm teaching or a concept that I'm teaching in my class, um, I can uh, go here and maybe I'm looking at documentary and I want to see uh, Mad Hut Ballroom. Um, and I can click on Mad Hat Ballroom and see how uh, this clip shows these ideas of the documentary. Um, and as we go through voiceover and talking heads and B-roll and all that great documentary stuff. So um, a really, really great uh, resource for anybody um, to access, uh, to really see in context, like what is, what is uh, you know, what is an aerial shot? Well, let's go and actually look and see what it is and how it relates to um, the rest of the, the film that's showing. So um, one of the great features that we have, again, on the website. Um, I think I'm going to turn it over to Emily. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about the curriculum that we've been putting together. Yeah. Great. So. Um... You've now seen, we wanted to start with, again, two um, resources that we've created that anyone and everyone can use. And I think they're really um, nice complementary pieces, the visual glossary, speaking to that, you know, our, our art form is cinema. Um, that's what we celebrate here is that is the visual language and grammar of film as an art form and the view now, do nows being the embodiment of the spirit of creativity and play and experimentation. And as you hopefully go in and discover some of those, again, they're just quick, um, they're quick prompts, they're playful, there's no wrong answers and a way to really engage um, learners of all ages and in all contexts. So um, uh, I'm gonna talk now, as I said, a little bit more about the culmination of a lot of these pieces and a lot of this thinking um, and that's our curriculum called Image, Sound, and Story. I'm going to ask Brady um, to bring up quickly um, just a snapshot of uh, what we call the JBFC Learning Framework, which is the most basic way to share with you our, you know, our way of thinking about uh, media. We're really trying to think about reading and writing of text and the reading and writing with media. And here you can see um, the viewing process and the creating process. So um, these are very parallel, as I said, to, to reading and writing. So in viewing, right, we're asking our students um, to be close readers of texts and how in that first viewing or first reading, we're noticing details where what are we hearing, what are we seeing? Um, on a comprehension level, we're thinking a little more deeply. What's happening? What is this story? Um, who are these characters? And as we go into analysis, that's where we're looking at meaning, right? And theme and subtext, the same way we're doing in our, in our literature and our poetry. Um, we're doing that with, with, with media as well. And then in the creating process, um, imagination is that conception, um, that idea, um, that material we're going to work with. Intention is that there's a planning process, there's thinking, there's, um, there's, there's thought and intention before we go and make the thing. And that's what we do in production. That's the culmination 
Um, the production is the actual execution of the, this thing we've imagined. Um, so there is a scaffolding of um, our, our um, of learning objectives and essential understandings also through the website you can find. But for purposes for tonight, this probably gives you just a good snapshot of um, the, the framework we've brought to the creation of Image, Sound, and Story. So Image, Sound, and Story is a series of projects, um, a series of units. They follow the same 10 literacy concepts that Aaron showed in the View Now, Do Nows. Um, we are now in our third year of um, implementing this program. And the teachers, as I mentioned, who are here with us tonight are all participants in this program. Um, the materials that they use are all hosted also on our website. They're through a back end. They get some special permission um, and access because of their training. Um, but all the resources, all the lesson plans and links to the visual glossary and embedded view now do nows are all on the website. So um, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm excited uh, to hear from them myself. And they've, they're all newer to this program. They've all been trained um, just in the past three months. They're all implementing this for the first time. So they are really brave um, to be talking tonight. And I'm so grateful. Um, we are learning so much from them. And um, we're gonna start with our um, fifth grade teacher, Jen Mundo. Hi everyone, um, my name is Jen Mundo and I teach at the John F. Kennedy Magnet School in Port Chester, New York. And um, JFK is a really special place. Um, we're a neighborhood school in Port Chester and we serve about 50% of, of our kids are English language learners. So that's a little bit of background um, about the kids who I'm working with every day. Um, this is my first year using Image, Sound, and Story, um, although I'm definitely not a stranger to the Burns. Um, I've worked very closely with Emily and Aaron um, over the past few years in some different projects. Um, so currently I'm teaching Image, Sound, and Story in my classroom, and I'm teaching to two sections of about 24 students. And the kids in my room are academically and culturally diverse. Um, also, I have some partner teachers who are also delivering this curriculum to the rest of our kind of grades. So there's about 140 kids in total who are interacting with this new curriculum. And um, it's just been going really well in my classroom because the work that we're doing is just a really natural and organic segue into the curriculum that, my, that I'm currently teaching and most closely connected, I think, to the writing that's being done. Um, for my kids, um, vocabulary acquisition is a constant goal. And using um, image, sound, and story, I've really been able to incorporate um, the vocabulary that they're learning into the writing that they're doing every day. Um, specifically, two techniques that we've been using are when teaching new vocabulary, really giving them um, a body movement to go along with that vocabulary word. So, you know, for example, if um, we're teaching the word um, to zoom, right, to to do a close up, um, you know, teaching them really to get close with their camera, um, and that movement is helping them really internalize not only the meaning, but then how can I apply it in other places. Um, so, you know, for example, for writing, for example, so the um, the idea of zooming in or getting close up. OK, so now talk to me about getting to a close up moment in your writing. Um, so, you know, I think it's just lending itself really beautifully to that vocabulary acquisition, the writing and also just the opportunity to collaborate and to, um, you know, take risks in the classroom. Um, we started using the curriculum right in the beginning of September. So it allowed my students to play and get to know each other and also set up classroom norms of this is the way that we're going to um, share ideas or this is the way that we're going to critique each other. Um, so it's just, it's been really successful. The website is so easy to use. The resources are, everything is there and, you know, ready for you to use. And, um, you know, I'm just really, I'm enjoying it. And I think my students are definitely for sure. All right, Alicia, if you can hear me, I'm cueing you. 
All right, excellent. So hi everyone, Alicia Robinson here again. I am a music teacher at Roosevelt School in Bridgeport, Connecticut. My school is pre-K through eight. We serve about just under 600 students. 100% uh, of the students in my school receive free lunch. Uh, and about 55% of our population is Hispanic. So we have a really big bilingual program here servicing students in kindergarten, first and second grade. So how I came to the Burns, uh, Roosevelt School was actually slated to close in 2010. And it is a neighborhood school in the community really rallied together uh, to make sure that the students in the community and the children in the community had somewhere safe to go and somewhere constant to go on, on our daily basis. So we fortunately were not closed and we became a sick school. And at that time, the administrator heard about a turnaround arts program and we actually applied. Turnaround arts is an initiative, a signature initi initiative of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities. And it actually is currently under the Kennedy Center as of November. So the program was aimed at bringing in arts and arts integration uh, high quality art specialists in the hopes of turning around school culture, uh, build parent participation, uh, increase student in, uh, uh, increase student attendance, decrease student you know discipline and referral uh, referrals. So as a part of the turnaround arts program, which we are now in our fifth year in, I believe uh, we came across Jacob Burns. So uh, my role in Jacob Burns, I actually teach two sec sections of the curriculum. I I am teaching an SRBI class or uh, RTI, which is what it was formerly known or still known in other places. And I have a project-based learning class that I teach once a week. So I'm about three weeks in with my SRBI group, who is a group of middle school students that I see four times a week. So these students I'm very lucky to have because they are the top uh, 10 to 15 percent of their, in regards to academics, of their classes. So I really have the highest students that were not in need of tier two or tier three intervention. So I'm able to provide enrichment. So it works out perfectly at Roosevelt School because we have three main initiatives. And one of the initiatives is arts integration, technology. We are a connected school. We have one-to-one -one iPads and every teacher has a MacBook. Every classroom has an Apple TV. We're in a brand new building. This is only the second year that uh, anybody has occupied this space. So we're really, you know, at the forefront when it comes to technology. And we also have the social emotional learning curriculum out of Yale. So out of those three initiatives, uh, the Burns Center and Image, Sound, and Story is really able to synthesize all three, uh, but particularly technology and arts integration. So as I'm working with the students in the curriculum, of course, we're building, you know, foundational skills. Everything is common core aligned. So even though I'm doing enrichment, I'm still able to connect literacy um, as well as build uh, core skills such as noticing details, inferencing, student social skills, you know, listening and speaking, uh, supporting your inferencing with evidence. And that's exactly what Jacob Burns and Image, Sound, and Story provides. So the great thing about this curriculum is everything is scaffolded. Uh, as we started the curriculum, the students started off with foundation so that we could just build a common vocabulary in the students. And then we moved into image. So some of the great things that I'm noticing from the students is how they're describing the images that they see or as they're responding to the view now, do nows. And because of all of the arts integration work that we've been doing at Roosevelt, our students have had a lot of exposure to VTS or visual thinking strategy. And I can hear the language and the quality of their responses when we're responding to the view now, do nows. So an example of that is in image, students are asked to um, look at point of view and in one of the view now, 
don't do now is they have to uh, look through the eyes of a character and they're asked to, uh, based on the image that they're looking at, tell about the character, uh, what do we know about the character and where the character is. So one of the students without any type of prompt was able to say, oh, this student, is, you know, this person is in a living room because I see the remote and I see the couch and, you know, just using their inferencing and supporting their inferencing with the evidence as a work, uh, uh, as a result of the work that we've been doing in the arts. But now being able to pull in the technology piece as well is really, um, you know, really able to move our students forward. Um, and, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so one last thing, sorry. So, you know, that definitely is one of the highlights for me as I'm doing this work and, and digging a lot deeper into it is being able to synthesize and integrate the arts and technology. And again, you know, two out of three of our major initiatives, but also in the curriculum, we talk about empathy. And that is a perfect tie into the social and emotional learning curriculum that we're doing as well. So, you know, Image, Sound and Story is really just this comprehensive program uh, that I'm able to tie in all of the, the district initiatives and all of the building initiatives into one and package it in something that's engaging uh, and really, you know, moving our students forward. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna give Bree, I'm gonna pause for one minute. Brady's gonna just screen share for another minute just so that we have a visual of what this sort of um, looks like online um, and the curriculum that these teachers are talking about and accessing is a great idea. So as you can see, this is this happens to be the grade six um, version, but um, it's very similar. They all got the same, um, you know, structure, the individual lessons and content are all unique to the grade level. So um, Brady's going to roll over. Here's the foundations lesson a couple people have referred to that just sets up some common vocabulary. And then an image project, a sound project, and a story project. And as we mentioned before, this grows into potentially seven other units. And um, in each project, there's the same format as well. There's always a view now, do now, a viewing section, another view now, do now, and a creating. And again, that was back um, based on the framework that we looked at. So that's the structure of the curriculum and of each project. And um, we always have a process of reviewing, revising, and reflecting on the work, right? Redrafting, going back, thinking about was the work, um, did it do what we intended? Did it have the impact that we had hoped? If not, how can we go back and make some changes? Um, again, helping to support some of that um, work we're trying to build in students in all of their work to go back and, and edit and, and make changes. So thanks, Brady, for bringing us back there. And um, I'm going to invite our friend Kate to share a few thoughts. Thank you. Um, I'm from the Birch School in Rock Tavern. We are a five-year-old um, startup uh, really rethinking learning. We were uh, 2014 recipients of an LRNG grant for our project, a Maker Ring project was based on the premise of having students work together collaboratively and supporting some of their best work. Um, so I came to this project through um, the Educator Innovator Partners website, which if you have not been there, is an incredible host of resources if you're trying to change up your curriculum or um, make it a little bit more uh, reflective for the kids or, or really rethinking the way that you're thinking about our students learning. The resources on the Educator Innovator webpage, Partners page are just incredible. Um, so the Birch School is really a mixed age learning community. We have 30 students uh, between second and 12th grade, and I'm implementing this program with our middle schoolers and our high schoolers. Um, part of the premise of the Birch School is really to um, rethink the way that students learn, and each of the children in our environment have an individualized plan. So we are prioritizing things like the power of play. Um, we are emphasizing collaboration, working together, and passion-based uh, learning. 
So this curriculum was really, um, I, when I stumbled into it, I was really happy to find it because it helps us meet many of our goals. One of our main goals is helping students become educated and informed consumers of media. And this takes it to the next step, which allows them to also become producers of the media. So um, since we have a, a much more open format than in traditional school. The students in our environment have had opportunities to create some of their own media and were really frustrated by what they were coming up with. So this seemed like a perfect way for us to teach them the basics and the mechanics of what is necessary to create good visual images and stories to communicate the ideas that they've been trying to communicate. And um, it is true that as, I, as I've introduced this program to our students, it is one of their favorite parts of the day. So I have um, created a class called Digital Arts, and I'm teaching two sections of mixed age middle school and mixed age high school, and I'm using the eighth grade curriculum. I was trained this summer in two days um, of training here at the, at the Jacob Burns, um, and that really prepared me to um, develop this program with students. The training that I went to included some teacher production, and I think that having the experience of being asked to produce some of the things ahead of time before asking the students to do so was really helpful. Um, some of the pieces that we did, I explained to the kids that these are sort of like free rights with video because very often they get really intimidated. We're gonna make a movie, how, how are we gonna do that? But when I sort of broke it down and said, this is just a, a one-time experience, we're gonna do it for 45 minutes, whatever you have at the end of the 45 minutes, bring back and we'll talk about, they seemed more free to engage with it. So um, we've been using it for a few months now um, and I'm, I'm seeing a lot of integration into our, the rest of our programming. One thing about the program is that the videos are very well chosen. The kids relate to them right away and the concepts that are being expressed are very easily demonstrated through the videos. So um, like Alicia said, the, the resources are all right there for you and that makes it really, really simple to deliver. Um, so uh, the other thing that we're finding is that many of our kids have skills that they're developing outside of the school classroom that they're now able to bring into the classroom and use and get a lot of positive reinforcement for, for knowing those things and for having those skills. I'm also seeing a lot of peer-to-peer um, -peer teaching. So some of our kids are more advanced in using iMovie than other kids, um, but they're sharing with each other and showing them. And I have been amazed at the speed with which the whole group has has mastered the skills of using iMovie um, far beyond my ability at this point, and I'm going to them for help. <laughs> so um, I think, uh, to, do you want to talk, should I talk about the sound one now? Or do sure. you want to in a little bit? Sure, that's great. So one of our favorite pieces that I really found um, really, really uh, stuck with the kids was the sound piece. Um, and uh, they have been thinking about the way sound is used in so many different ways after we've done um, the sound lesson. And so recently we went to see a play, we went to see Inherit the Wind, and in the play there was one, um, one musical piece, it was a harmonica, and the harmonica was um, going in and out of the play as diegetic and non-diegetic sound, and which is sound that is inside the performance and sound that's it's sort of a soundtrack. And when we came back after the play to debrief, this was something that they had they had talked to each other. What When was it diegetic and when was it non-diegetic? And so I was really struck by how easily they were transferring the skills that they had learned through this program to other experiences that they're having. Um, a play is not a movie, it's a different type of visual experience, but they very easily um, transferred that. I also think that the work that we have done in, in the video pieces prepared them to really experience the play in a much more meaningful way. Um, and they are just hungry for more of this. <laughs> so it's been, it's been quite a success and a really nice match with the basic philosophy of, of our program and of what we're trying to deliver for kids. So um, I'm just really grateful to have become a part of it. Well, um, I wanted to thank all of you. I, um, you're all incredibly, as I said, courageous for jumping into something new. Um, it's striking to me all over again how disparately you're using it and how it's ranging from a vocabulary builder to a classroom builder to um, a technology enhancement. 
um, and you're all making it sound really easy. And so I wanted to put it back to the three of you to either respond to something you heard and something that sparked for you or made you go, oh, I meant to say that too. And or what are the challenges? Because those have to be there too. And I think um, to provide, you know, the, the, the real portrait of, um, uh, you know, experiences as teachers in the classroom trying something new, there are those too. And I think in, in fairness, we should hear about that. So anyone want to? I can Jen's add on. Gonna start. Yeah. So um, what Kate was saying before, how when your students went to go see the play, they were able to transfer the information that they had learned in sound. And we had a really similar experience. We came to see the Eagle Huntress mm -hmm. and we had just finished Image. And the students had learned about different camera shots, about panning and tilting and zooming. And they actually had an opportunity to have a Q&A with um, one of the producers of the Eagle Huntress. And when he he said the word pan, um, I think the entire audience like jumped because <laughs> they were just so excited that, you know, these words, these um, these ideas that they had been playing with in their classroom were like actually real life things that mm -hmm. um, the real producers and real, um, real, you know, real productions were using. So I just thought that that was so interesting. That transfer is just so beautiful to see. Um, and, you know, you're just seeing kids kind of come alive in, in, in using this type of curriculum. I know for us, it's such a nice part of the day and they really, they crave it mm -hmm. in the sense of they, they can't wait to kind of get to, get to our Jacob Burns kind of time. Um, and, you know, I just, I'm, it's an honor to, to, to be a part of it and, and to work with you guys. Cause you know, I'm just seeing my kids in such a different, different light, you know, this year. Any challenges, Jen? Um, honestly, the challenges is probably like not having enough time during the <laughs> week to do more because I really think that you just see a different side of kids during, you know, this during their time. Um, not really a challenge, but more of um, something that I love about it is that because of the breakdown of, of each lesson between the view now and the create and the reflection, it just parallels so much to what we do in class. You know, when I'm introducing a new reading strategy or a writing strategy, it's always about observation and try at first and then going on independently and trying to create or try something, you know, new on their own. And then that reflection piece is the revision and editing kind of coming to life. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I just wanted to add, you know, that one piece in and how manageable each section can be. You can do a lesson in 45 minutes from start to finish, or you can choose to do a quick view now, do now for 15 and then revisit it, you know, the following week. So, you know, sorry, no, no, no it's all right. right now. <laughs> Kate, Alicia, is there something you want to add to the conversation, something that sparked or a challenge? Um, I know for us that some of the challenges are having enough enough tech tools, like okay. having enough devices the to tools. use. Yep. But I think that one thing that's really um, excellent about this program is that it's really enable, uh, enabling us to teach with their, the kids' own mobile devices. So mm -hmm. I had not anticipated allowing students to use their own devices. We have a number of iPads that are available, but it actually... Um, we are actually allowing them to use their phones and they've been going home and asking if they can get iMovie, which is $5, onto their phone. And so that's been helpful. Um, I think another challenge for us um, is time, which you wouldn't think because we have an open, a more open format, but um, the time is really an issue. We could spend quite a bit of time and I would be <laughs> comfortable doing that because I think that what they're getting from the program is so valuable in so many different directions. Um, and one thing that's a problem for us is our internet access mm -hmm. and we had talked about that the other day yeah. and that um, very often um, sometimes the videos are slowed and that's just an internal Wi-Fi situation mm -hmm. that we have. Um, so those are some of our challenges but none sure. of them are anything that we really couldn't overcome in an easily, you know, pretty easily. Sure. So. Alicia, what do you think? Alicia, what do you think? Yeah. So one of the things that I'm really enjoying seeing is how the students collaborate together. But also when you take a look at students who are, you know, in the traditional academic setting in the math classroom or maybe social studies or science, and you know, they're not the student that's the first to raise their hand or to respond. And you know, you have students that are really uh, reclusive, you know, in those types of envi environments, they have an opportunity to shine uh, and then through the arts and technology and through image, sound, and story. So I have one student in particular who is, you know, extremely quiet, 
off and disen disengaged. She's extremely intelligent, but she just she doesn't like to be in the center, you know, of any type of attention. She doesn't like to respond. She's really disinterested. She understands what you're saying, but she she's not really there, not really connecting. And this is a student who I can give an iPad to, and you know, in responding to one of the view now do nows uh, as part of the curriculum, you know, really comes up with just these incredible images. So the image that was shown earlier of the Coca-Cola can or the, the soda can that was her and the group that she worked with, you know, so she has all of these tools and this vocabulary and this knowledge and this skill set that now she can engage in this work and demonstrate, you know, to the adults that, you know, she is capable of absolutely doing the work, but then also the building of relationships as she's working in the group with her peers as well. So they even get to see a side of her that maybe they didn't know before. And, you know, it really helped with the connection and the building of relationships between the students in ways that you wouldn't necessarily think, you know, and that's so powerful. And I know oftentimes we think about test scores and, you know, how the learning translates onto paper, but it's so much more than that. This student and these students that, you know, are having their self-confidence built because their interest is being sparked through this work is, you know, so much, um, in my opinion, so much more powerful than, you know, what the, her state scores come back as because that self-confidence piece is, as it's continue, uh, list, continuously built over the years, is what's going to help her, you know, translate better into the paper and, and pencil um, typical test. Um, one of the challenges, again, I would definitely say would be, you know, access to technology. However, I strongly encourage individuals to, you know, think outside of the box. You do not necessarily need, you know, a classroom set of iPads by no means for those districts that have cell phone restrictions and policies against students bringing them into the school, you know, then you may need one or two devices. It could be a personal device. It could be a Chromebook that has a camera. Um, it could be an actual camera, you know, and even though we don't use, we don't think of cameras as, you know, being so useful anymore, but, you know, there might be like a local uh, media center or something that has some that they're not using anymore because, you know, with the technology, it outdates pretty quickly. And instead of them throwing it away you can ask for a donation or also donorschoose.org is an incredible resource and you know any teacher across the world can submit a proposal and as a potential donor I can go to this individual site and say hey you know what I want to fund an arts project and donate um, a, a monies towards some iPads, which you might only need two or three, you know, to support this work in a classroom of 30 or more. And again, encouraging the collaboration is really going to be uh, key to the success. Well, you guys just like, um, I think, touch on some threads that are really important that aside from the particular way that Burns is doing this, that you're using media that's meeting students where they are, right? You're introducing um, an ability to collaborate in the classroom that's just too scarce right now, that they are too often in this independent mode and in one singular mode, which would be with words and text, like you're giving them a more multimodal entry point into meaning making and critical thinking. Um, you're letting them be creative. And um, these are not experiences that are unique to image sound and story. Um, they're certainly what we celebrate in it, um, but they can be found in, in a number of resources. Um, I think that all of the, um, the connections that you're making to the other things that you're doing are really rich. I think the literacy, the technology, um, you know, the, the collaboration and, and the um, learning is play. Um, I think I may have not used your exact phrase, but um, you guys give us faith that there is space for this um, in this culture of, of assessment. And yeah, Kate, Kate wants to say, say one more thing. Um, I also think, you know, um, going back on what Alicia was saying about some of the kids having skill sets that aren't necessarily really recognized or affirmed or not a lot of positive reinforcement for, all of a sudden a student comes with this skill set and it's it's useful and it's helpful and they have skills that they can share with other students. I think it also introduces that for some of my students, the idea that there's a possible career in, mm -hmm. 
in this mm -hmm. kind of work. And I think that, you know, planting those seeds at this point is so important for this moving forward. So it's another possible career for our students that they might not have had exposure to. And I think that that's really the future of, of this. And this is how we can serve them moving forward. Yeah. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. And that like, yeah, again, takes me back to that video piece we started with, right? And we all, we imagine like, what will that day be when one of our students is the guest up on the stage across the street at our theater? Um, and I know that day is going to come and you guys are all a part of that so um we are out of time um i'm gonna let brady bring up our last slide um which is an important one because it's um tools to stay connected um we hope that you are part of the connected learning community if you're not as kate pointed out their website has a tremendous number of resources um, and also here's the url for the burns film center's education homepage, where you can find the view now do nows and the visual glossary and the learning framework and how to contact us there's email um, addresses there there's you know contact information we'd love to hear from you we would love to stay connected um, I'm so grateful to Alicia and Kate and Jen and Aaron and Brady and other colleagues um, here at the Burns, Justin, Sarah, Paige, and a whole team that has made this possible. And um, that's us signing off. <laughs>